Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of the Ometown Daily News Show. I am Marwat. That is ometown.com. I'm here on Twitch streaming every day. Um, yesterday I did this at one o'clock. It felt really good. Um, today I'm doing it at one o'clock as well, but I'm a little bit early. Um, no real reason other than I wanted to start this off a little early. Um, during the week, I think I'm going to continue to do it at 11 o'clock until uh, next weekend when I'm going to shift, um, to a longer term, um, on the weekend, I'm going to stream longer and, um, this summer I'm going to be streaming at least, um, at least six hours a day, uh, all kinds of stuff from gaming to news, um, to niche topics. I'm going to try and kick off a couple more of the, the niche shows, um, that are in hometown. Let me get us over to the news. Um, so what is hometown? Hometown is a, a news aggregation site and it funnels hundreds of articles a day, if not thousands, um, into uh, six main categories, create news, education, entertainment, social, and technology. I go through them at the beginning of every episode. Um, if you're sick of it, then send me a message and I'll nix it. Um, but I need to let new people know uh, what it is that I am doing, um, so I do that little snippet. I guess I could add it as a, a sound bite at the beginning of every episode without doing it in the actual stream. But, you know, screw it. We'll do it live. I'm going to do uh, the most expeditious way for everybody. Now, one of the other things that I've been considering doing is knocking this down from being a very a much more serious show than I intended it to be. You know, I, I, I really want to, to kind of, I don't know, be a little bit more uh, user-friendly, I guess you could call it, um, and have a, a different take on it. Uh, I tend to bounce between jokey commentary, I, but I feel better when there's more people in my chat and it's real time that I'm kind of riffing off of the audience, so to speak. Um, but uh, I, I don't have many people in my chat, uh, although my chat tells me in one way, again, I've said this a couple of times, that I've got like 30 people in my chat, but then the other metrics are saying that I've got one or two or three, or sometimes I get rated, uh, which is awesome. Uh, but I don't know who is really here. So uh, to those who are in chat, Awesome. Thank you very much for coming. I hope you get something out of it. And let me know if uh, you want me to change tack and, and focus on something. Because in reality, I have these 50 shows. And I, I plan on bringing them to Twitch. Uh, but it's really uh, about being able to dedicate that time. And uh, I just can't do it while I'm uh, working full time. And I work uh, typically about 60 hours a week. Uh, if not more, because I, I work and, and I also have other things, other projects. Um, at any rate, uh, would love to hear from you all. So uh, swing by either uh, Twitch or Twitter or YouTube or Discord. There is a Discord channel. You can get it, a link from the podcast. Oh, amazing. I also have the podcast over on Apple Podcasts and Google and Spotify and others. Uh, but those are the three main ones. And uh, you can use whatever pod catcher you have. Uh, at any rate, let's get into today's news. It's a mishmash as usual, a rather holistic look at what the last 24 hours of news is. I'll try to avoid bringing up uh, Johnny Depp and uh, Amber Heard um, and, and the horrible things that have been done uh, to uh, Johnny Depp's bed. Anyway, oh, sorry. Uh, totally tangent. Um, the first article is over in uh, the Daily News Show. It says, Court Leak is catnip for those who love juicy DC whodunit. Um, there's nothing official. Washington loves more uh, than a juicy whodunit. So let's click this link and just go straight over to ABC News. I'm going to try and get through this news um, and uh, get this published so that you all can enjoy it if you're downloading just the podcast. 
And again, it's over on YouTube too. This is a, an article uh, by, a, well, by uh, Nancy Benack um, or Benick uh, from Associated Press for ABC News. And it says the publication this past week of a draft opinion said that Roe v. Wade, the landmark 1973 decision establishing a constitutional right to abortion in the United States was wrong from the start and should be overruled, has set off sleuthing from every corner of the Capitol. It's all double hush hush and people are trying to find out who could possibly have decided arbitrarily to disclose an opinion that's based on hundreds of year old opinion and uh, old school thinking about what is right and wrong from a population that was even more fundamentalist than today's population and setting forward the path of modern society and what they can do. And while at the same time saying what a person can do with their body, demanding that nobody tell them what to do with their body. It's rather amazing, regardless of the whodunit. I, whistleblowers are awesome. I think that people should blow the whistle because abuse happens in the dark. And this happened in the dark only set forward into the public eye when somebody else was ready. Kind of disconcerting as a member of society. So, like I said, in the same, as they're inhaling, they're saying, you can't do this with your body. They exhale and say, you can't tell me what to do with my body. I'm not sure how this goes about, but I feel gaslit. Um, and I'm a guy. I shouldn't have anything to say about what a woman does with her body. It is beyond me as to reaching back hundreds of years to set the legal foundation for 20th, 21st century society. Uh, I mean, we were thinking people were witches back then and and either hanging them or burning them or stoning them or demanding that they dress a certain way, all kinds of stuff. And it's always either another race or it's another gender. And it really bothers me for some reason. I, I, maybe it's because I am not a sociopath, but why, why are we litigating <laughs> as to what a person can do with their own body? Now society, and, and if you look around, just look around, you'll see all kinds of people saying, Hey, you can't make me wear a mask, just a mask. You can't make me wear a mask so that I don't kill other people when I am exhaling. And in the U.S., we're at a million people that have died because of COVID, just the mask, let alone the vaccine. You, you tell people that they have to get the vaccine and they'll go, oh my God, what are we, you know, China? And then you go look at China and yeah, they're actually injecting people and saying, hey, take the vaccine. Um, and, and bolting them in houses and stuff like that. And, and this is the result, you know, this, and, and while these ultra conservative justices are, and others in that same line are saying, um, what amounts to, you can't, you are telling, basically they're saying that if, the other side, which probably amounts to 95% of society, gets their way. They will do everything they can to oppress and blah, blah, blah. And then you look and every single accusation is a confession of exactly what they are going to do. The moment they have power, they overturn something that has been in place for almost 50 years. And the moment that they're in place, they burn books. And the moment they're in place, they're telling everybody else what they have to do instead of what 95% of the rest of the world is saying, which is be inclusive and allow everybody to have a voice. Now, there are countries that are, are, that are a lot tighter than the U.S. And who knows which direction the U.S. is going to go, depending on how many ultra conservatives get in place, but the, 
the fact of the matter is that we are all human beings and we shouldn't be oppressed by a small, loud few. But here we are. You know, this whistleblower is going to be hunted down until they find out who it was. And then they're going to litigate. They're going to sue this person. They're going to charge this person with... There, there was a statement made by a senator, I think it was, that said that the person tried to subvert the, um, the Supreme Court. And I'm like, what? subvert? They're disclosing to the public what has been hidden behind a closed door. Eh, subvert. This is, they're, they're not, you know, <laughs> eh, untouchable. They, they are people as well. Just the only reason why they have authority is because of their position. You respect the position, but this is absurd. You know, they, they, the people manipulated the public and got into office saying that they wouldn't, we would never overturn the Roe v. Wade. It is the law of the land. And then the first chance there is a majority, boom, gone. So let's continue on. I wanted to get that out of the gate fast and, and uh, continue on with the next article. And if you're in my chat, welcome. Uh, let's do that. There's the next article, Dark Quest, board game available on early access, developer. Um, it says Brain Seal, which I haven't heard of yet, um, has made its latest title in the Dark Quest series available on Steam Early Access. Dark Quest board game seeks to emulate an adventure tabletop game. Each run sees players creating a party at the camp before going on a procedurally generated adventure aiming to defeat the sorcerer at the end. Adventure cards and dice rolls play important roles in the game, which features a turn-based tactical uh, combat system. They had me all the way up until the uh, turn-based tactical combat system, only because I am into every other aspect of this, but I don't like turn-based turn games. I don't know why. Uh, I grew up with Dungeons and & Dragons and every other iteration of role-playing game that you can possibly imagine. Um, created my own uh, role-playing game, um, similar to, um, well... Well, GURPS might as well. Uh, that's about as close as you can get. Um, and I uh, have the storybook world called Aerith that's part of this, of Ometown. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm really into role-playing games. I haven't been able to play in a long time. Um, but I love role-playing games. I just don't like computer-based tactical, turn-based tactical combat games. Uh, but let's go over to the source of this article. Uh, it's over at rpgamer.com. And um, there's a little screenshot of it. I won't go through all of it. And um, I encourage you to go over to rpgamer.com. This article is written by Alex Fuller. And apparently a Dark Quest board game is available for early access over on Steam. And it has a 10% launch discount until May 11th, according to this article. Um, and you can go over to RP Gamer and look at the pictures and watch the video. There's a trailer that's over on YouTube as well. Um, but that's pretty much the nuts and bolts of that uh, article. So be sure to go over there and watch that video. They'll give them credit. Credit is due. And uh, the next article is over on the Hatch Ideas channel. Um... Amazon has fired several senior managers at its unionized warehouse, a report says. So Amazon on Thursday fired several managers at a unionized warehouse in Staten Island. The New York Times has reported the Amazon labor union met with the U.S. President uh, Joe Biden last week to discuss anti-union tactics. Meanwhile, Amazon workers at another Staten Island warehouse, LDJ5, voted against unionizing last week. Amazon has fired more than half a dozen senior managers who worked at the warehouse called JFK8 in Staten Island, New York, which successfully unionized in April. So you can probably count on litigation coming out of that. And you can't fire people for unionizing. Um, so, <coughs> pardon me. I'm not. Unfortunately, I didn't hit the mute button in time. Uh, businessinsider.com. The next article is, uh, uh, was written by, sorry, that article about, uh, Amazon 
firing senior managers was written by a Geody man and uh, goes into greater detail. It says four anonymous former and current employees told the publication that the senior managers were informed they were being fired by the e-commerce giant on Thursday. Um, there's like a picture in this stream of my expression when I hear about that. Um, Cause nothing says, Hey, why don't we end up in litigation? Like firing somebody after they unionize. <laughs> Uh, Amazon told the New York Times that it had made changes to management after it spent weeks reviewing its operations and leadership at JFK 8. Sure. Part of our culture at Amazon is to continually improve, and we believe it important to take time to review whether or not we're doing our best or doing the best we could um, for our team. Okay. So approximately 61% of Amazon workers that were eligible to participate cast their vote in, from April 25th to 29th, and a majority rejected the attempts to organize at LDJ5. Ah, I'm curious about that. The election has concluded without the union being recognized at LG, LDJ5 Sortation Center in Staten Island. Okay. Um, and one thing that I can say about unions is that as the culture changes within an enterprise, the idea of a union either uh, ebbs or flows. It's, it's one way or the other. And what's interesting is sometimes a union will form because it's spearheaded by a personality, a kind of a cult of personality. And people believe in what they're, they are saying, the words and the actions, and, and think that a great change is going to come when the union comes. And then that person leaves, um, and everybody is still wandering around because they're not guided. And the union itself doesn't necessarily uh, mean much when the visionary and the, the change agent uh, vanishes. Um, and so uh, it's not unheard of for a union to kind of end up in place even after the people that created it have left. Um, let's go on to the next article. The next article is about uh, pro-choice. So if you're not into that kind of stuff, I understand uh, some people aren't uh, interested in talking about that kind of thing. But again, the show is a holistic look at the news, not necessarily what I want to bring to the table, although my bias is pretty clear. I like talking about things that are socially driven um, impacted by technology and business. And uh, this here is a, a, a social change that is coming to the United States um, and influenced by internal and external forces without a doubt. So this is in the Hatch Ideas channel, but it is uh, because it's been uh, put there because my aggregator saw it coming from Business Insider. So it's a pro-choice um, issue, but pro-choice protesters are swarming Brett Kavanaugh's house shouting my body my choice which is identical to the people that were saying my body my choice about masks um, a group of abortion rights activists protested outside Brett Kavanaugh's house Saturday night my body my choice the group can be heard shouting in a video posted to Twitter the protest comes after a leaked draft um, shows the Supreme Court appears poised to overturn Roe v Wade now um, for a bit of context about this, the Supreme Court and the law in general is not supposed to be popularity driven. It's supposed to make the people whole when they are harmed or defend the citizenry from abuses when somebody violates that contract. So you have criminal and corporate law and other kinds of law, um, but it's really about trying to find equity, equality, um, and making those harmed whole. Well, I'm not, uh, while Roe v. Wade is legally on uncertain footing historically, it had become the law, the, the lay of the land because uh, nobody really challenged it, right? And nobody saw that a more progressive and liberal uh, society would go after that. Um, but that is what has happened over time. Now, Roe v. Wade really didn't 
uh, have a good, wasn't really a good decision based in um, the historical context of law. It was really challenging the, the previous existence of law wherein people were referring to it as one crime or another, um, but it took away the rights of the state and made it, or the states, and made it the government saying everybody has this right. Um, and now it's going to be cast down to all of the states and all of these triggers and all of the states that are pro or con will light up um, and uh, society will change. Um, now, there's a lot to this, uh, depending on how you look at the machinations. A lot of people say machinations. I don't like the word machinations. I like machinations because it, anyway, doesn't matter. I won't get sidetracked. Anyway, the, the idea here um, is that now the states are going to be making all of these decisions and states are a more finite uh, cultural bubble. So the people within the state are the people who have an identity within that state. Now, a lot of states have a high population. That population is more social. That social population is tends towards liberal, <laughs> tends towards inclusive, not exclusive, not breaking it into smaller and smaller bits, not marginalizing people because we are a mass and we are all sharing. Um, but there will be what amounts to microcosms of society now within states dictating what the state does because they no longer have the greater population of the United States weighing down, saying everybody has a right to choose. Now, this has happened in other countries where they have banned abortion. And what has resulted was a population spike that's untenable and people who don't want uh, children. But some in one country that I read about, they were actually forcing women to go to the doctors to make sure that they weren't having something, uh, 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 an abortion performed or trying to even, even take birth control. Um, and here in the States, Perhaps that's what this is all about, is that there, there is a, a microcosm of uh, little dictators that want to make sure that women are pregnant and having kids. Um, because why? Uh, well, because if you can't afford anything, then you end up turning to somebody else and trying to find salvation or hope within that organizational unit, that particular body. Um, you won't have the ability to dedicate your whole body to finding uh, education and employment. And I've even heard from a senator saying, well, these women are unloved and overeducated, which is absurd to me. I mean, they, they literally, this person literally is saying that uh, he, he, again, it's a, it's a guy. Uh, he is saying that he wants women, uh, dumb and, and, and that's what makes them approachable to be loved. Sure. Taken advantage of, but loved. Okay. Anyway, so. I agree with all of this. It's my body, my choice. And as a male, it's not my body, my choice. It's their body, their choice. Um, so keep up the good fight. I am not interested in overturning Roe v. Wade. I want it codified that every person has a right to do, particularly in that instance, what they need to do with their body. Because I understand that it isn't a simple choice of waking up one morning and just saying, I want an abortion. Um, so let's click the link. Well, it'll take us over to Business Insider and it has pictures. And and uh, again, like I said at the beginning of this uh, stream, the, the same people that are sitting there saying, uh, I'm going to prevent you from making a choice are also screaming that they want their choice. So 
uh, these these particular fundamentalist people um, are are deciding the fate of others, and they are a, a minuscule uh, portion of people uh, of of the population. And really, if you want to change what a state is and what its state makeup is, then the people that are uh, looking for a new place to live and think that they want to um, they could uh, make a living in these more um, I don't know, antisocial states um, should be able to just move over there and uh, change the dynamic because that's what it's going to take. Educated, social, level-headed, uh, <laughs> um, open arms type of people and, and not people that are trying to be oppressive and, and um, regulating of others. You know, all of this about masks and getting the vaccine and all of this is a strong ask. It isn't a mandate because if the government wanted to, they could mandate it. But no, that's not what's happening. Everybody was asked to go and get it. Could you go into social places without a vaccine in some instances? No. Why? Because society told you. Sorry. You can't enjoy all of the social and still just take. You had to give some back. And the antisocial behavior is, I don't want a vaccine, but I'm willing to kill you with the virus that I am asymptomatic of, and I'm going to infect you with every sniffle, or every time I grab the door handle, I transfer my, my uh, virus onto the door handle, and then you get it. Uh, you open the door and you get the virus and you're the one that dies. And so it's just antisocial. It's so animal and base. Anyway, let's continue on. You can go over to Business Insider and read more about this pro-choice protester swarming around Brett Kavanaugh's house. Um, it's written by Yelena. I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Uh, Janova, I guess it is. Janova. A D Z H A N O V A. Um, okay, so let's continue on to the next article. I do have about 20 articles and I'm only about five into it. So let's keep going. I'm going to start trucking through this. Um, Disney investors are focused on streaming, but don't forget about the theme parks. A little over a year, uh, Disney theme parks have rebounded from massive pandemic related um, operating losses. And, um, oh no, sorry, I need to change something. Um, so Disney theme parks have rebounded from massive pandemic related operating losses. And that's because everybody was really pent up and needed to go see the happiest place on earth. I keep forgetting about this. I need to just log in. Uh, this article is over at CNBC written by Sarah Witten. And um, has a big old picture of Disney. In April of last year, this the author um, took a stroll down an empty main street in Disneyland with the head of Walt Disney theme parks, Josh Diomoro. Diomoro? Yeah. Uh, the California Park was a week from opening after more than a year of being shuttered due to COVID-19 restrictions and cast members were hard at work putting the last touches in place before guests arrived. Um, I've been inside uh, uh, Disneyland and, and Disney World when it's been really, really quiet. Um, and the previous time that I ever saw any park that quiet was um, Knott's Berry Farm, like 25 years ago, not to say how old I am. Um, but it's, it's really interesting when it gets really quiet. Um, juxtaposed to the fact that I've been at the height of Disney world, <laughs> uh, jam packed with people. And, um, it's a, it's a completely different place. Anyway. Um, and, I don't know. To me, it's enjoyable when it's quieter, but they've been raising prices um, and costs of stuff inside, and they've never really hit a balking point where people are just going, no, I'm not going to go. 
Um, they, people just really love going to Disney uh, theme parks. Anyway, um, I think that uh, we need more Disney theme parks in the United States. Um, but that won't drive business and um, create exclusivity if there are a bunch of them. But there's one in Florida and one in California. In the United States. There's others other, in other places. But anyway, let's continue on to the next article. Um, there is a TikTok challenge we all need to face up to. Now, I have not clicked this link. I don't know anything about it. Um, all I know is this headline in the snippet, a social media platform uh, that we social media platforms that hold and shape our attention need to be governed in the public interest is what this article is all about. And it's from the New York Times. Now, I'm going to click the link um, and we can go over this really quick. Um, the article is an opinion piece by Ezra Klein. And it says, at the core of the frenzied interest in Elon Musk's acquisition of Twitter is an institution that I think is right. The major social media platforms are, in some hard-to-define way, essential to modern life. Call them town squares. I cannot, sorry. Um, that's my opinion. Uh, I will not call them town squares. Call them infrastructure. No, they are not infrastructure. Why? Because anybody can spin up a social network. Anybody. Ometown.com is... A social network it just doesn't have a lot of people publicly discussing anything why because it hasn't been in existence for 10 years um, and hasn't gotten any traction but it can pull people away from all of the other places if people found value in hometown.com enough to actually post i do see traffic and people are going to the articles um, that are aggregated and then they're going off to the other sites but the fact of the matter is they are not town squares it's all a business enterprise. A town square is a loss for the town. It is essentially wasted space for business because it's not capitalized on. It is a place for people to just sit around and enjoy the day from the, all the rest of the businesses that are around the environment. That it flies in the face of what all of these are. It is not a town square. It is a business. I can kick somebody out of my business. I can kick somebody out of my house. You can't kick people out of a town square unless they are disturbing the peace. So if a business wants to, and it's a lot harder, okay, you have to be really overtly a pain in the butt for somebody to have you kicked out of the town square. And it ultimately has to be some tiny little place in the country where the police are uh, Gestapo like and have complete authority over the town and, or somebody within it is kind of like a tiny little oligarch where they have political might and economic force where they can tell the police to tell you to get out. That's how it works. But that's not what Twitter is. That's not what Facebook is. That's not what TikTok is. That's not what any of these are. They are business enterprises, and Ezra Klein has it wrong. Um, it says here, or he says here, Ezra says, uh, they exist in some nether region between public utility and private concern. No, they are a private concern. They are too important to entrust to billionaires and businesses, but that makes them too dangerous to hand over to governments. This person is so confused sorry i keep interjecting my particular opinion on these things but that's kind of what this stream is about i bring the news you can go there and and click the link it's in the show notes it's it's in the stream go and click it and read it for yourself and again i say you may not have uh, agree with the opinion of a news article and come back and talk to me about it we may have the same perspective, or I'm going to have a differing opinion to the article and you, but let's talk about it. Um, you know, it says here, TikTok as we know it today is only a few years old, but its growth is nothing like we've seen before. That's because TikTok is a snippet. It, it, it holds no long form anything. It is pithy statements and, and little video segments. It is not discourse it isn't a classroom it isn't an office 
It isn't a public square. It isn't social discourse. It's little snippets of thought encapsulated in video and thrown out for everybody to, to see. Um, and, and so it is a business enterprise and it's built off of the adrenaline rush and, and chemical rush um, by clicking and watching these little snippets uh, based entirely on popula popularity and driven based on an algorithm to make sure you stick to TikTok. That's not a town square. In 2021, it had more active users than Twitter, more US watch minutes than YouTube, more app downloads than Facebook. Yeah, it had a ton. In one quarter, it basically had <coughs> um, somewhere close to a third of the population of the United States downloading it. Now that came from around the world, not from the United States, but somewhere around a hundred million uh, people downloaded TikTok. Um, the app best known for viral dance trends, uh, but there was a time when Twitter had 140 character updates about lunch orders and Facebook was restricted to elite universities. It was very short lived at, in that stage. Things change, perhaps they already have. A few weeks ago, I gave a lecture at a Presbyterian college in South Carolina and asked some of the students uh, where they like to get their news, and almost everyone said TikTok. Yeah, because it's tiny little snippets of information, and it's pithy. That that little that that pithy little segment, right, where it just grabs somebody. It's the viral nature of TikTok. It says it's owned by ByteDance, a Chinese company, and Chinese companies are vulnerable to the whims and will of the Chinese government. Yeah, there's no possible possible ambiguity on this point. The communist, uh, the Chinese Communist Party, spent much of the last year cracking down on its tech sector, and yeah, and then has subsequently opened it back up. Um, you know, they they wanted to crack down on it so that they could have control over it. Now they have control over it and they're opening it back up as much as they want while limiting its access to its its domestic population. OK, I'm going to continue on. I think Ezra Klein is wrong. Um, so the next article is over in the Hatch Ideas channel and it is uh, a tr this author, uh, not me, um, Tried McDonald's snack wrap in Canada, and I completely understand why some customers are clamoring for it. That's their words, not mine. So Mary Meisenzall is the author of the article over at Business Insider, and they've tried the McDonald's snack wrap, which I have not. Um, on a recent trip to Canada from their home in western New York, they stopped by McDonald's to try some dishes that aren't on U.S. menus. And um, this is this is an article from about six hours ago, but um, it uses some of the material that I spoke about in a previous episode um, about McDonald's pulling the snack wrap away um, from U.S. restaurants. Oh, pardon me. Um, it says it looked like a typical tortilla neatly wrapped with no filling spilling out. Um, and then inside of it is a crispier grilled chicken um, tender. So... And some other things, lettuce and tomato. and um, Let's see what else is in there. I don't know. Dun -dun -dun. They also ordered a chicken and bacon McWrap, which I guess we don't have. I don't eat much from McDonald's. If I eat anything from McDonald's, it's probably the little two cheeseburger meal uh, because I like the bun to burger ratio. Some, and if you get a bigger bun, like uh, there's a restaurant nearby that makes spectacular burgers. I can't really mention them because the, they're hyper local um, and it wouldn't make a difference, really. Um, and uh, that, it's amazing. It's amazing. And they have everything. The, uh, the whole ratio is right. And it's phenomenal. It's also five times uh, the price uh, as a combo meal from McDonald's so just for the burger. Anyway, uh, we'll see. Maybe McDonald's will bring it back uh, if enough people make some noise about it. So, you know, this is the important stuff that we're talking about here. Uh, the next article is over in the Hatch Ideas channel. SpaceX president uh, predicts people will reach Mars before the end of 2020s. 
and land on the moon sooner. Uh, the SpaceX president and COO predicts that humans will reach Mars before the end of the 2020s. Uh, in an interview with CNBC, uh, Gwyn Shotwell also said she thought people will be on the moon sooner. Her comments echo similar predictions uh, made by SpaceX CEO Elon Musk in December. Well, she's not going to counter Elon Musk for crying out loud. Um, this article is over at Business Insider and written by Sa- Sam Tabaridi. And, um, you know, like other Business Insider articles, they have the little snippet of text and then uh, an image of some kind. Um, he also said that the company's biggest challenge was to engineer a vehicle that can optimize tonnage into orbit and then on to Mars. Starship is the most complex and advanced rocket that's ever been made, Musk added. And more recently, the tech mogul made other another prediction that humans would be on Mars by 2029. That would be spectacular. And um, sign me up. Yeah, I, I, I'd go to Mars. Um, as long as I'm immune to the political and, and uh, these uh, hyper... Whatever. I'm going to move on. Uh, before it can launch, the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration has to sign off and complete an environmental review of the activities at Starbase, the South Texas facility. However, the FAA has delayed uh, the review of SpaceX's new launch four times already. Hmm. Come on. Let SpaceX do its thing. Um, you know, there's a lot of money sitting here wasting away, and, and time is... Time is money, friend. We're, I'm not getting any younger. I mean, I want to be able to sign up and take a trip to space. Uh, the next article is in the order of the brew. It's all about beer. Video course, uh, old-fashioned lagers and smoked beers with live oak. Are you ready for this one, lager nerds? In this discursive but detailed video course, live oak founder... Chip McElroy and head brewer uh, Dusan Kwiatkowski, I guess, um, talk smoked beers, pre prohibition lager, cereal mashes, decon- deco- decoctions, and much more. Decoctions. That's interesting. I've never heard that term. Um, this is over at beerandbrewing.com. Um, and, um, the authors say uh, it's a video course and it says that the video requires all access subscription, but it says among the topics they discuss are the benefits of decoction mashing, mashing, sorry, uh, adjuncts and cereal mashes for pale American lagers, working with corn grits and from mash to lauder to clarity, fully avoiding DMS and adjunct lagers, bitterness and hopping, uh, yeast pitch rates, fermentation, harvesting, and lagering, and so many other things. Um, you might be interested in this, uh, but to do it, you need to subscribe. Um, I have no relationship with this organization, with this website, um, but I'm always interested in uh, this kind of thing. Um, you know, some beers are really nice, and uh, I haven't had a drink, though, in uh, more than two months now. I've been uh, testing to see i'm going to be testing to see what abstaining entirely from uh added sugars and from uh, alcohol does to my blood chemistry um and in the same vein i'm looking at getting uh, a tonal from tonal.com um i am no i really don't want to share how old i am because i don't act old i don't feel old and the stream just died. This is bothering me. So the stream is dying. I don't know what's going on. Let me just do this. Doink. Um, at any rate, the uh, I want to get a tonal, which is all, on, all in one gym. And it, it allows you to kind of hyper focus and not have uh, a massive gym around you. And it can only do 100 pounds per arm. Um, but it's not like I was at that level, uh, in my prime. Um, but you kind of nix all of these things, uh, sugar and you control your diet and you control, uh, alcohol intake, uh, to a greater extent. 
and then you start working out and um, you can measure adequately um, the impact of a re uh, exercise regime in a regulated way uh, and the tonal does an amazing job of this because it counts everything you do um, with uh, smart sensors in the equipment that you use to work out so um, it's pretty amazing uh, now i just have to get it um, at any rate and it's expensive but let's continue on to the next article the next article is about um, coca-cola it's been aggregated into the hatch ideas channel probably because of the source and it says coca-cola opened its first european store in london featuring a mocktail bar and 250 dollar branded sneakers so let's go take a look it's over at business insider and um, it's written by abby wallace and there's the coca-cola branded store so ultra niche but people are always interested in it and i'm sure sneakerheads have already bought up the 250 dollars shoes they seem to be pretty inexpensive in the grand scheme of elite niche shoes um let's continue on so all kinds of branded stuff for coca-cola pretty simple and if you're uh, <laughs> if you're a cokehead you can go into this coca-cola store <laughs> uh wow I think it's funny because, well, anyway, sometimes I, if you have to explain a joke, it's not funny, right? While the Coca-Cola Boss Varsity jacket has a price tag of uh, 121 U.S. dollars or 98 pounds, uh, the shoes were 250, 195 pounds and 241 dollars. But, yay, you know, yeah, exchange rates always are changing, fluctuating a little bit. So pretty cool. Go over to Business Insider and uh, look up that article, or you can always follow the link from hometown. Um, the next article is also in the Hatch Ideas channel. 1,000-year-old Native American carvings of mysterious giant humanoids discovered on the ceiling of an Alabama cave. Um, uh, I, the aggregator has got, got this uh, really early this morning, um, but um, SNL had... Um, made jokes about it well made a joke about it that the art was really horrible i had spoken about this in a previous episode um, that the artwork was highlighted um, nobody can really see it unless you're in that in the uh, the, the cave and um, or looking at the pictures uh, close up because the the ink part of it is or whatever it was that actually highlighted this is gone um, just kind of weathered away uh, because it says it's more than a thousand years old, but nobody really knows how old this stuff is. Um, but it's in an Alabama cave, so it definitely shows uh, that people were in that space. It says a study uncovered massive human-like figures etched in the ceiling by Native Americans more than a thousand years ago. I would just say natives, not really Americans, because they weren't Americans. Uh, <laughs> that is a a uh, rather modern term um and and there's a real there's a reality here that there was a population in north north america well before anybody thought of calling it america um it says uh the figures three of which were humanoid in shape are among the biggest ever uncovered in the northern americas some are more than six feet long per a study presenting the findings published in the peer-reviewed journal Antiquity on Tuesday. I would love to get all access to all of these journals, um, but sometimes they're outrageously priced. And publishing a paper in any of these things is just wonky. And then everything is behind a gate. Um, so you have to be a student. So that's why I am perpetually, I'm a lifelong learner as it's called. Um, known as glyphs, the unique carving sculpted in the soft mud in the cave ceiling could provide clues into the traditions of Native, Native American peoples of this uh, southeastern U.S., as the study's authors. Yeah, we know that Native Americans over a wide variety, uh, wide area, sorry, have certain ideas in their religious concepts that they share. They believe in a tiered universe, said archaeologist Jan Semek. To believe that there were 
the spirit worlds all around them that permeate the natural world, even though you couldn't see them. Yeah, this is really interesting. This anthropomorph in Regalia, 5.9 feet tall. Uh, wow, this could actually be like the actual size of a person. Um, looks like he's holding rattles in his hands. I don't know about rattles. One looks like an axe, and the other one looks like something being held, but not a rattle. I don't know. Um, I don't know what that could be. I'm actually kind of, I want to be reserved and not um, say that this is what I'm actually thinking. I mean, we can talk about it if you're interested in this kind of stuff. Um, let's see. Boink. See my, the, doggone it, the stream keeps crashing. I just don't know what's going on here. It's definitely not my internet access. Um, the next article is over at PCGamer.com. Uh, the recording is local, so I'm not using the stream actually to create the um, recording that goes over to YouTube and to um, the podcast. So all of this is going to be recorded in a higher quality than the stream, apparently, because my stream is showing unstable. And I just don't know why. Um, at any rate, uh, this next article is over at um, PC Gamer, I think it is. Uh, D&D board game Tomb of Annihilation is being pulled from Steam. Just to let you know, it seems to already have been removed. It says, unfortunately, licensing agreements being what they are, BKOM study Studios has announced that Tomb of Annihilation will be delisted from Steam on May 20th. Uh, while it no longer be possible to acquire the game or any of the additional content on that date, the developer explains players who have the game in their Steam library will be able to play it and enjoy all of its content. In the Tomb of Annihilation 4 Adventures, or 5 with the DLC, uh, travel through the jungles and dungeons of uh, Cult, I think it's pronounced C-H-U-L-T, in the Forgotten Realms, uh, searching for a way to end the Death Curse. Uh, I went over to... Um, not just PC Gamer to read the rest of this, but um, I was curious if it was still there, but I can't pull it up as Tomb of Annihilation. Um, so it might be uh, Tales from Candle Keep, uh, but I did not check for that. Uh, so this article is over at PC Gamer by Jody McGregor. And um, if you search for it, I think you're going to have to look for... Um, Tales from Candle Keep, uh, which says, uh, the article says that it'll be delisted on May 20th. I guess it's the end of the licensing term, which is a shame. There, there just always seems to be these licensing issues. Uh, the next article is over in the Word and Tech. California governor signs executive order shaping cryptocurrency regulation in the state. This is something that I've said is coming in one shape or another, regulation of cryptocurrency. California Governor Gavin Newsom signed an executive order on Wednesday that lays the groundwork for bolstering and regulating the cryptocurrency industry in the state. As outlined in the executive order, Newsom's goal is to, quote unquote, to create a transparent and consistent business environment for companies operating in blockchain that it balances, quote unquote, the, the benefits and risks to consumers. Yeah, and there's a lot of um, unknowns when it comes to blockchain and cryptocurrency and really what it is. Now, it, it, at the most simplistic level, I understand what it is. In some of the more complex environments, I understand what it is. But its entire value is pegged to standard currencies um, and or some ephemeral embodiment of a contract bound in a blockchain um, that says a person owns this or owns that and then you have nfts that are similar um, it, it's too esoteric and um, 
it's the cryptocurrency it's the currency version of the legal establishment it's arcane and abstract and uh, only a select few who embody the desire to dig deep into it really understand all of it from end to end and have the means to exploit it um, and that's really what cryptocurrency is and a lot of people have you know followed scripts and ended up with a massive amount of currency but the reality is that it's just too abstract for the average joe uh, to embrace it wholeheartedly and make it of value i really am astonished that my stream is so broken today i've lost 6.8 percent of my frames and i don't know why I really don't know why. Um, one second. Let me see if I can do something here. One second. Okay. Sorry, I'll remove this from the recording, but sorry for the dead air. I'm literally at half my bandwidth, but for no reason. And now it says it's excellent, but my stream is still broken. Okay, let's continue on. Um, the next article, oh, and yeah. You can go over to The Verge. Emma Roth is the author of this article about the California governor signing uh, an executive order shaping cryptocurrency and regulation in the state of California. And um, a lot of other states follow California in their uh, legal embodiments. So I would expect that New York, if it doesn't already have something in place for cryptocurrency and I just don't know about it, um, it will be following suit rather shortly. Every once in a while, well, nowadays, you just never know, but I'm sure uh, Florida will do the opposite of this um, so that it can embolden the select few who might be able to take advantage of it. Um, it's it, There's a lot of predatory policy, but at any rate, let's do this. The next article is over in the Mobile Channel. And it says, microbe-based faux beef could save forests and slash CO2 emissions, gradually replacing 20% of the global beef and lamb consumption with meat-textured proteins grown in stainless steel vats. It could cut agriculture-related CO2 emissions and deforestation in half by 2050, researchers reported. And like all things science-related, there will be people that blow back from this in and, an and almost vitriolic way. Uh, even even though there is a really good chance their existence is entirely founded on science saving their butt. Um, and in this case, this is um, probably going to be the future in short order as statements like I have heard from others that the era of cheap food is gone. Um, and, and that's because there has been enough acquisition and mergers that a very select few are the food producing uh, businesses for the common Joe. Um, very few businesses are in charge of our food production because uh, small farms um, are disappearing, uh, priced out literally because things like inflation costing diesel to go up to $6 a gallon. And when you're spending hundreds of gallons trying to just uh, collect your crop it's wildly expensive to produce food and it's going to continue that way until a greater competition puts some downward pressure or science like this um, produces some uh, competitor uh, from a vacuum i mean we gotta we have to change the the dynamic um, and i would rather not have to kill animals to get our food. Um, that may be the way that nature has animals predating on other animals, but we are sentient entities. We are human beings that have a choice 
um, in how we consume and what we consume. And if we can use science and it doesn't impact anything other than how we purchase it, I'm all for it. So this says compared to current trend uh, projections for population growth and food demand, swapping half of red meat consumption for so-called microbial proteins would see reductions in tree loss and CO2 pollution of more than 80%. Uh, they reported in uh, the journal Nature. So I think it's really interesting that they do the whole 80-20 uh, split. Um, that, that's just kind of fascinating. That's the Pareto rule. Um, and you can say one way or the other, really, about the 20%, 80%. 20% is created and 80% consume. Uh, in this can th this context, it's 80, uh, 20% of global beef is replaced with meat texture uh, proteins, and it will save uh, 80% of, uh, it will reduce the tree loss and CO2 pollution uh, by more than 80%. I think that's uh, that might be a little bit of um, uh, stat manipulation. But let's continue on uh, before I run too long in this stream. Um, the next article is in the Smack Talk channel. It's all about Mac. Uh, Apple finishes move of iCloud documents and data into iCloud Drive. One year after announcing it would roll iCloud documents and data into iCloud Drive, Apple has confirmed it has completed the migration of the cloud-based service. So in May of 2021, Apple signaled that it wanted to reduce confusion and streamline its iCloud storage segments, including the discontinuation of documents and data, moving that data to iCloud Drive. Almost 12 months later, it has done all of that. So let's go over to the Apple Insider article that this is aggregated from. And uh, Malcolm Owen is the author of the article. And what I said is basically the summary, but there is greater detail over at uh, Apple Insider if you want to find out the minutia of uh, what went down. So you can enable iCloud Drive if you haven't already. Um, and for the most part, everybody has iCloud Drive active. And you get a copious amount of space. Uh, and it is largely accessible from any platform. Um, you just have to have the connection to it. So you just log into your iCloud account and it is your iCloud Drive. Um, and to me right now, it is transparent. I still have the documents and data uh, in its standard place, just like I left it, except now it's iCloud Drive. Um, the next article is over in the Hatch Ideas channel. This is the last one for today, and then I'll bow out. Um, and uh, this one is Mystery Monkey Spotted in Borneo Forest could be a rare hybrid of two different species. An unidentified mystery monkey... That was the name of my um, Bee Gees and Monkeys um, cover band in high school, uh, Mystery Monkey. And uh, all we did was sing, um, never mind, I can't keep this going. I think it's funny in my head, but anyway. So Mystery Monkey spotted in Borneo. So the unidentified Mystery Monkey could be a rare hybrid of uh, two different species, a new study says. Interbreeding between distantly related species is rarely observed in the wild. According to the study, the hybrid monkey could be an alarming symptom of an ecosystem out of balance, the study co-author said. He could be describing humans at this point. What? Okay. Um... A silvery linger on the left. That's These are pictures that are in uh, the Business Insider article that was written by Alia Shoab. And um, the title of this is Mystery Monkey Spotted in Borneo Forest Could Be a Rare Hybrid of Two Different Species, New Study Suggests. So it says the proboscis monkey is on the right. So that monkey has a big old nose. Um, and I'm trying to see if there is a picture of the hybrid monkey says it's pictured here. I don't normally do this, but I'm going to click this link because I don't see the picture in the article, which is really interesting. And um, I want to see what this hybrid monkey has the physical characteristics of both species. So let's click that link. And um, oh, it has like a little nose. 
Oh, it has a smaller nose. Um, yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. And it has like a, well, that's the only thing that I can really tell. I mean, it looks like it has a little nose, a little offshoot from the um, proboscis monkey. Cool. Okay, well, with all of that in mind, a whole bunch of news, about 20 articles were thrown at you. I hope you got something out of it. I hope you liked it. If you are more, if you are interested in this kind of stuff, come back tomorrow. I'm going to try and do it at 11 o'clock.
Thank you.